Good morning, church. My name is Stephen. It's great to see everyone here, especially if you're new with us. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Let me pray before we jump into the message today. Father, I am always mindful of my need for you to speak and our need for you to truly hear. But Lord, this morning, I'm especially mindful of our need for help. As we talk about family, which for so many is a painful topic, for others an exciting topic, got people coming from different perspectives and seasons of life with different needs. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would speak individually to every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Richard and Mildred Loving, the couple married right here in Washington, D.C., were arrested upon returning home to Virginia. Their crime was that one was black and the other was white. They were ordered to leave Virginia, and their case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1967, marriages across racial lines were legalized in all states. And to think that was just 55 years ago here in our country. What makes Richard and Mildred loving their story so compelling and so beautiful to me is the resolve and the commitment to each other in the face of intense adversity. When you think about, in comparison, really the lack of resolve and commitment in most relationships today, their story is really stunning. In the West, in America specifically, we have the wedding part down, don't we? I mean, I say this with fear and trepidation with three daughters, but the average wedding costs $35,000. Breathtaking venues, extravagant food, DJs, photo booths. I love a good wedding. I love to party. But we're not quite as good at getting to the finish line in our marriages. It's been well documented that half of marriages end in divorce. And as a result, even the way we talk about divorce has changed. Consider this joint Instagram post from a celebrity couple who recently got divorced. I didn't want to embarrass them. I didn't put their names up there. But they say, we share our family news that we are parting ways in marriage. We share this not because we think it's newsworthy, but so that as we go about our lives, we may do so with dignity and honesty. The love between us carries on involving in ways it wishes to be known and lived. We free each other to be who we are learning to become. Wow. If you take that at face value, it almost makes it sound like divorce is pleasant and the desired outcome. But despite the flowery language, we, we know better. We know the pain that divorce caused to everyone involved. And here's how millennials like myself and Gen Z are dealing with that pain and how they're responding to watching many of their parents' marriage crumble before their eyes. Robert Emery, a psychologist at the University of Virginia, told the school's publica publication, here's a quote from him, it says, it makes young people today less secure in the idea of committing to and being in a lasting marriage. Much of the rise in cohabitation as an alternative to marriage is actually an alternative to divorce. He added, saying, if you never make a commitment, you're never going to divorce. And the stats back up Emery's claim. The marriage rate has been in decline since the 1970s. You can see that chart there. The U.S. marriage rate among women is the lowest it's been in over a century. According to the List article, how marriages have changed in the last 100 years, people are now marrying later in life. In the 1950s, the average age for a man in a marriage was 20 or 22, and a woman was 20. Now, about 60 years later, 2016, they took stats from 13,000 weddings, and now the average age is 29 for women and 31 for men. In his book, Marriage and Modernization, How Globalization Threatens Marriage, Professor Don Browding cites British social scientists, I love this quote, who predict marriage is doomed and will be virtually extinct within 30 years. 
you got to love the eternally optimistic British social scientists. <laughs> but really, their prediction may not be too far-fetched. There has been an explosion of Reddit communities, Facebook groups, and TikTok accounts of what are called openness, open or non-monogamous marriages, quote-unquote, where two individuals in a relationship openly and consensually bring other people into their, again, quote-unquote, marriage. All of this, in summary, is we live in, in a day where half of marriages fail. As a society, we're postponing marriages later and later. We're preferring cohabitation as an alternative to divorce. We're entertaining these open marriages We've essentially tried to redefine what marriage is. And this is the result of what American sociologist Robert Bella calls the expressive individualism of our day. Have you guys heard this phrase? He defines this as where each of us seeks to give expression to our individual lives rather than seeing ourselves embedded in communities and bound by natural and supernatural laws. In essence, our ultimate authority comes from right here, from how we feel, rather than from a community or even from God. So today we kick off a series called Meet the Family, where over six Sundays we'll look at the biblical vision for family, including marriage, parenting, singleness, where family dysfunction comes from, what to do about it. And what I hope to do through this series is to lay out before you two competing visions. One, the modern individual expressionism, expressionism that I've outlined here, and secondly, that biblical vision of marriage and family, and allow you to choose which you find more compelling. And the stakes are incredibly massive. I mean, you think about just this room right here. There are real serious implications for which story you find more compelling. Implications like who you choose to marry, whether you choose to stay married, whether you have kids, how many kids you have, where you put your kids in school, how you view and interact with dysfunction in your family, how you process and heal from that brokenness in families, how you view singleness and your single state if you're single, how you encourage and pray for adult children or grandchildren if you're in that season of life, how you talk to neighbors and coworkers and family members about these things. The implications will be shaped by what story you find more compelling. And so today and over these six Sundays, I want to give you an opportunity to choose. Now, in the nine months we've been a official church meeting on Sunday mornings, we've done a couple different sermon series. One, we answered the question, who is God? And basically, we did what's called an exegetical sermon series, where we walk through the book of Exodus looking at who God is. And then kind of towards the middle of the year to up until now, we did more topical studies, looking at the church and the distinctives of Grace Covenant, our core values answering the question, what is the church? And so in this last uh, study that we're going to do, the last sermon series before we get to Christmas, this is more a, a survey of the entire Bible, of what the Bible has to say about family. And finally, by way of introduction, um, this is going down as one of the longest introductions known to sermon preaching, but I did want to set the table for you because for some of you, I think there might be a temptation to check out on certain weeks. Like if you're married on the week about singleness, or if you're not married today as we talk about marriage, or if you don't have kids when we talk about parenting. But let me encourage you that this series as a whole, and you developing a biblical vision of family, is incredibly important to every person here. Because I hope to show you over these weeks that if we care about this city, and part, if you're new to us, our vision is to win Washington, D.C., to Jesus Christ, to play our part with other churches in this DMV area, to see every sector of society come to know Jesus Christ. If we care about our city, we need to care about families. 
Because as the family goes, so goes the society. Today we look at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2. The sermon title is How to Become One, or How to Become One. There's a little double entendre there. Did you catch that? Okay, cool. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, right at the outset, we need to answer two questions. In what way was Adam alone that was not good? And secondly, what does God mean by the fact that he says he will make him a suitable helper or a helper fit for him? What does he mean by that? Now, Genesis 1 and 2 are complementary stories of creation. Genesis 1 is really the broad story of God creating the world in six days, the light, the sky, earth, sea, vegetation, the sun, the moon, the stars, animals, and finally humans. And Genesis 2 really goes in more in depth on the story of humanity. It's clear from the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 that God established a hierarchy in his creation. In chapter 1, God is the one naming. He's naming light and darkness and heaven and earth. And in naming these things, he's expressing his dominion. Because generally speaking, whoever is doing the naming is the one in charge. But here in chapter 2, in the passages that, in the passage we just read, God forms the land animals and the birds, and he brings them to Adam to name. He's giving man a gr the great privilege and the responsibility to share in his dominion or his rule over creation. And while many people who may not follow Jesus, secularists, atheists, agnostics, may not acknowledge this part, we share a, even with those who don't believe in God, a responsibility and understanding that we as human beings have a responsibility to take care of this planet. Like, even people who aren't following Jesus are not going to Congress and appealing that the apes name and steward this earth, right? We all kind of have this inherent understanding that we are responsible. And Genesis 1 and 2 speaks to why we as Christians believe that. Because God gave us that responsibility to rule over this earth, to care for it, to steward it. We, as, a, we have, as Christians have a responsibility to care for our environment, to care for animals, to care for creation. But as God is parading the animals before Adam, and Adam is naming them, something is missing. Now, I didn't see this until this week, that everything in the creation has a complementary pair. So God creates the sky... But then he creates the sun, moon, and stars to fill the sky. He creates the sea, but then he creates the fish to, to fill the sea. He creates the land, the earth, but then he creates land animals and mankind to fill the earth. Each animal has a male and female counterpart, but not Adam. There's no helper fit for him. And as much as we love pets... As so much as we love our dogs and our cats, and they have a special place in our heart, animals can't provide the companionship that God intended and purposed for man to have. The only thing God declares to be not good in creation is that Adam is alone. So God says, I will make him a helper fit for him. Which leads us to our second question. What is the meaning of helper? When God says he'll make a helper fit for Adam. Now, the Hebrew word here is azar, helper. And when we use that English word helper, we think of someone who's inferior, like a, a mommy's helper, someone who doesn't have the same responsibility and role or strength, almost like a servant. But that's not what, what's happening here with this word. The word azar, helper, means to save from danger to deliver from death. It's the one who supplies strength in the area that is lacking in the help. It's often associated with a shield. In fact, 16 times in the Old Testament, 
The word Azar is used, and it's almost always used to describe the way God helps his people. Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help, where does my Azar come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So a wife, a suitable helper, is really to be a shield, a source of strength, a deliverer for her husband. And I've experienced this in my own marriage. I haven't been married nine years. It's a miracle because if you knew me, you'd say it was a miracle. My wife has endured with me. But I was just thinking about some ways that she's helped me. And I, I jotted down five things. Some are big, some are small, no particular order. But this month, this past month, we celebrated our 40th anniversary as a church. And I'm very linear, as you can tell from 35,000 slides that I'm presenting today. And my wife is very creative. And so three weeks ago, she said, hey, you know, like the Sunday that we're going to celebrate the uh, 40th anniversary, like, do we have any, like, balloons or, like, cookies or anything, like, make it festive? Honey, that is a great idea. We should have that. She helped me in that moment. I'm a big picture type of guy. I'm thinking about 10,000 feet above the ground. I'm thinking 10 years in advance. She very much is in the moment on the ground floor with this gift of mercy. And there was a couple here a couple weeks ago just had a baby. She said, hey, I think we should sign up to provide a meal for them. That is a great idea. I'd completely forgotten about them. A couple very close to us. <laughs> Thirdly, I'm often overwhelmed as you know, a, a dad with young kids, this church plant. Uh, I have a tendency to overschedule myself. And again, I have no expectation that my wife should do this. I'm not saying this is the role of a wife, but every once in a while as I'm heading out the door and I've forgotten my lunch, she'll say, sweetheart, I packed you a lunch. I joke with her. She has five kids. I'm the fifth. <laughs> Fourthly, I am black and white to a T, and she's shades of gray. And so a few weeks ago, I saw something on social media involving this couple that was not a very wise thing for them to post. And I thought it was my responsibility to address that. Black and white, justice, baby. She's like, hey, I don't think you're the right person to talk to this couple about that. And she saved me. She delivered me from what could have been a really difficult relationship. Fifthly, I'm a thinker. She's a feeler. Oftentimes, I'm quick to discipline our kids without getting to their emotions and what they're feeling and what God's doing in their heart. She helps me in our parenting. She's my helper. Now, let me speak to the married men here. And we're going to work our way around, okay? So don't elbow anyone too hard, okay? But the challenge we face as men is that in our pride, we say it either out loud or in our hearts to our wives, I don't need your help. And so her difference becomes a source of conflict rather than of compliment. But God says it's not good for you to be alone. You need a helper. Don't resist, men who are married, don't resist God's help to you through your wife. And for the women... Wives, here's a temptation to blur the line. I'm not going to make any eye contact. I'm not making any eye contact. To blur the line between helping and controlling. Where you're helping really isn't helping. It's controlling a situation. So a great question to ask your husband is, would it help you if I dot, dot, dot? I'm, my eyes are glued to my notes right now. <laughs> glued to my notes. So here's God's solution for finding Adam a helper. Here's what he does. He puts Adam to sleep. Now let me talk to some of the single men here. I've noticed that the men who are often awake need to be asleep. And the men who are asleep need to be woke up. Here's what I mean. There's men swiping on Tinder, sliding into DMs. We're going there. Sleeping with women, and they have no clue what it means to be a man. No relationship with Jesus, no commitment to a local church, no character, 
no integrity. They think they're awake, they're on the prowl, when really they're just hurting woman after woman and in the process hurting themselves. The best thing, the best thing for men like that is to go to sleep to the idea of marrying a woman and allow God to heal your heart. Allow him to touch your broken past, to renew your mind on scripture, to give you a biblical vision of manhood, of being courageous, of leading, of laying down your life for a woman. And allow him, God, to transform your heart, to make you into man that he's called you to be. But then I got men in the church who are asleep that need to be woken up. I'm hanging out with men who love Jesus, who have a great job. They're financially secure. They're the, of the age to get married. And it's like, dude, wake up. Look around the room. Not now. Wait till after service. But look around the room. Sometimes God puts us to sleep so we can't get in the way of what he wants to do in our lives. Or today, he might be trying to wake you up to your Eve. While Adam sleeps, God forms Eve from Adam's rib. And really, the better translation here is side. It's the same word used for the side of a building in Scripture. Now, I love this quote. I use this in every one of the uh, marriages that I officiate. Matthew Henry, the 17th century English minister, wrote this. He said, she was made, referring to Eve, she was not made out of his head to surpass him, nor from his feet to be trampled on, but from his side to be equal to him and near his heart to be dear to him. God brings the woman equal in value and worth to Adam. Now, notice the second half of verse 22 here. It says, and the rib or the side that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now, I said we're working around the room here. We're going to talk to the single ladies here. For some of you single women, I know it's hard. You're doing everything right. You're loving God. You're serving. And you're thinking, when am I going to meet this man? And I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. God, form me into the woman who's ready to be brought to my man and bring me to him like you brought Eve to Adam. If you try to bring yourself to him, I'm not getting a whole lot of amens right now, <laughs> but if you try to bring yourself to him, you'll get frustrated. You lose hope. Yeah. But God is the ultimate matchmaker. Right. And him bringing you to your Adam isn't entirely a passive thing. It may involve you cooperating with the Holy Spirit. You might organize some, some game nights. You might create a dating profile. I'm not against it. But you're led by the Holy Spirit. And you allow him to inspire you. And you know the difference between when you're allowing him to bring you to that person rather than you bringing yourself. And I'm working it. I'm praying for men. I'm getting in men's lives. I'm helping them. I'm helping them, ladies. <laughs> Adam names the animals, but with Eve, there's something different. He doesn't name her as much as he proclaims her. Verse 23, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, my wife and I, we have a tradition of almost every one of our wedding anniversaries, we watch our wedding together. And generally speaking, you don't remember much of anything the officiant of the wedding says. But I remember one thing very clearly. It echoes in my mind from time to time that the person who officiated our wedding, Corey Bendix, who's our outreach and evangelism pastor, he said this one line that I love. He says, if, he was talking to me, and he says, if you don't sing her praises, her praises will go unsung. Men, don't call her the ball and chain, Amen. the old lady. Brag about her in public. Right. Tell her how great she is. And the anointing you have as your husband to affirm her will be echoing how God sees her to those around her. Then the writer of Genesis draws some conclusions for marriages 
from the original couple. And this is important. This is not just for that couple. This transcends for all cultures, all places, all times. He's speaking to all marriages. And the reason why I say that is because Jesus echoed these same words in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul used the same exact words. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, while men and women are equal in value, they have different roles. And part of our cultural narrative today is to try to erase these differences between men and women. But notice, the man is charged to leave his father and mother. The woman isn't given this charge. It's not that he's to now ignore the fifth commandment and he's just to throw aside his, his mom and dad. But he's charged to leave behind his parents as his first priority. He has a new first priority, and it's his wife to hold fast to her. From the very beginning of a relationship, it's the husband's role and responsibility to lead and to initiate in the marriage. Simple ways you do this. Asking at the dinner table, one of the practices I have. It doesn't mean I pray every time, but I initiate that. Sweetheart, will you pray? Or my son, or my daughter, or I'll pray. But somebody's praying at the dinner table. I initiate that as a husband. I initiate conversations about our, our relationship with God. What are you reading in the Bible, sweetheart? What's encouraging you? doesn't mean that she doesn't initiate those at times, but I have a responsibility to lead and to initiate. And I see so many times men passively not taking care of their family or leading spiritually and the effect that it has in the home, the effect that it has in the kids. He's to cleave to her. Now, this word is used in covenants. It's not just a man and a woman entering into a relationship. It's a man and and a woman overseen by God, a three-stranded cord that can't be broken. And that's what a wedding is. It's a covenant-initiating moment. There's vows, there's charges, there's witnesses, because God is there. God is entering into that relationship. And you don't go into that lightly. You seek counsel. You seek confirmation because there's no do-overs. There's no just kiddings. Cleaving is staying together forever. And when man leaves and cleaves, God does something supernatural. He weaves. They shall become one flesh. The one Adam that became two in Adam and Eve become one again in marriage. A man and a woman, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman, not a man and two women or two men and a woman, one man, one woman, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, and they become one. Quoting this verse in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul calls this union a profound mystery because of what it's a picture of. When a husband cleaves to his wife, when he chooses to love her, even when she's at times unworthy of love, he looks a whole lot like Jesus. When a wife submits to her husband and chooses to respect him, even when at times he doesn't deserve to be followed or respected, she looks a lot like the beautiful bride of Christ, the church. And the two together profoundly and mysteriously give their children their extended family, their unbelieving neighbors and coworkers, a picture of the gospel. See, that's why this expressive individualism, the whole do what feels good in your heart, and when it gets tough, just say your love has evolved. That's why it doesn't cut it. It's crippling, and it's an oppressive story. Because there's nothing unconditional. There's nothing mysterious. There's nothing profound about following your heart, and ultimately just doing what you want to do. You're looking at that other person in that story, in that framework, and hoping that you'll measure up, that you'll keep being good enough, that you'll keep being funny enough or pretty enough or loving enough so that they don't walk away from you. But when you and your spouse participate in God's story, look at the security 
and the trust that it produces. Verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's a picture of complete safety, of freedom, of intimacy. To know that the good, the bad, the ugly is exposed, and yet you're loved anyway. That's how God loves you in Jesus Christ. It's unconditional. You don't earn it. He just lavishes it, lavishes his love on you because that's who he is. He's love. And I recognize today that for many of you, that's far from the picture that you've experienced. And the next Sunday, we'll talk about family dysfunction. We'll talk about where it comes from, how to heal from it. But let me just say for today that that's why we need the gospel. We routinely blow it, all of us, even those of us who are trying to mirror that picture in Genesis, we constantly fall short, and it's why we need the grace of Jesus Christ, why we need people in our lives helping us, praying for us, telling us we are messed up when we messed up. I'm grateful I got men in my life who my wife can call and say, my husband's tripping. Get him. Because I recognize I need the Holy Spirit. And he's got to do a work in me and my wife. I was thinking um, today, what am I a product of? I am, listen, I am far from, and you all know, the perfect pastor. But by the grace of God, there's a measure of health in my life, in my marriage, and in my family. And I think it's because of two things. One, the institution called the church. If it wasn't for the church, I wouldn't have met God. I wouldn't have experienced his presence in a meaningful way. And two, an institution called a family. My parents have been married for 36 years, 36 years. My wife's parents married for 40 years. My mom's parents, 52 years. My wife's grandparents, 72 years. When you have that kind of legacy, Think of the things, the trauma we didn't experience, the dysfunction we didn't, didn't experience. Every family, every marriage has issues, right? Have things that we have to overcome. But I started, in a, if life was a four-by-four four relay, I started on the fourth leg instead of the first leg because of those who went before me. I recognize in this room, some of you are fighting for your marriage. You're wondering, is this going to last? Some of you have painful stories about family and dysfunction. But let me tell you what's at stake. Generations down the line yeah, yeah. are going to be impacted by your story. And it's never too late if you have experienced a failed marriage. It's not too late. My hope would be that we would be a church that could surround you, that could help you heal and be the person God's calling you to be. So today I give you those two choices, expressive individualism, the story our culture wants to sell you, do what's right in your heart, and if it doesn't work out, move on to somebody else. Or one man, one woman, together forever for the glory of God, you choose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your vision for family. You instituted it. You began it. God, I thank you for the wisdom, your wisdom. You are infinitely wise. And Lord, we want to be a church that models healthy marriages, that prays for, that supports healthy families, that, Lord, our city would be transformed and they would see a picture of the gospel in Jesus' name.